Moving on, let's get this PCB, Printed Circuit Board is the acronym, separate from the plastic housing here. This would be something you might want to do if you needed to solder anything here. Maybe there's a bulging electrolytic capacitor and you want to replace it, so you need to get it the underside. So you can see there's this sort of awkward shaped piece of shielding here. There's two screws attaching that. All of the screws here, unless I say otherwise, are going to be of this type, just over a centimetre long, wide ferrule, brassish appearance, crosshead Phillips type slot. And they're going into plastic mounting posts on the case. And uh, you can see that I've been in here in Vance and written on these parts with Sharpie. If you ever wanted to remove that, say you were selling it on, you could use um, isopropyl alcohol and a little bit of paper towel to wipe this off. But you can see that I've marked where that goes. Let's remove this. Um, I guess that's probably a voltage regulator or some other kind of high heat dissipating transistor here. In a situation like that where you've got a transistor off to the side on some sort of metal plate or something, um, do make a note to yourself about which way around they go. You can see that there's a brown wire on the right as we look at it and then two white ones. So on the plate underneath I've written BWW to remind myself which way around that goes. I would leave these in situ if you possibly can. So that's what I will do for this demonstration. We've got screws around the edge. So we've got one here. Two, three, four. So one in the center here. There's two we already removed to do with that shielding and then there's one here. At that point, if you tip forward from the front to allow the tips of these two quarter inch jack sockets to come off, then that will tip out like so, giving you access to the underneath. See how that shielding has a folded bit under? Don't confuse yourself into thinking that that folds back and goes over the top. It does need to be underneath like that. Um, you can tell that because, I don't know if you can see in this light, but there's um, a series of exposed metal dots around there, so they're meant to contact with that for some reason. So do leave that folded underneath and sitting on top of that mounting post. Um, if you choose to take that out, that's probably attached yeah, glue or double-sided tape or something, so I won't remove it. Also, since I've already detached the cable from that transistor, there's no real reason to detach the heatsink plate that it's attached to. I mean, circumstances where you might need to do that, I suppose if someone spilt a lot of liquid in here and you needed to give this a deep clean, then you'd tear this out, remove this from the two mounting posts there, and you could use double-sided carpet type tape to reattach that. Unless you find that that transistor is faulty, then I would leave it attached there. If you had to take it off or replace it, then remember you're going to need to use some sort of uh, thermal compound um, of the type that you use to attach a heatsink to the CPU of a computer, um, just to make sure that you've got a good thermal connection between that transistor and its heatsink. Now let's detach all the printed circuit boards from the upper part of the plastic case of the 44. We'll start with this uh, little jack board here. You can see that there are holes for three screws. I've already removed two. Um, the one that I've left in, it passes through the lip of this piece of shielding, connecting this shielding to common ground. Again, unless I say otherwise, we've got these approximately centimetre long brass-ish looking crosshead screws with a wide ferrule going into plastic mounting posts. That metal plate comes out of there. You can see that these tabs fit into slots on the board. Um, you may wish to write on this. You can see I've made a note to myself in Sharpie pen that can be wiped off with isopropyl. To say that the tab from the shielding goes there, I might also, if I've got a lot of parts of different machines lying around in the workshop, might want to write on that that this comes from a Tascam 424 Mark 1. You can see you would have access to all the tracks and components for this little daughter board which has the input sockets on it and be wary of detaching these cables. I would, if at all possible, just leave those dangling because those can be very tricky to put back in place. The same goes for this socket here. I've replaced it. I've crimped on a um, JST type socket just because I did remove that ribbon cable and then couldn't get it to connect properly. So I would advise you to leave that plugged in. This one's soldered in anyway. But we've got two screws here. So if we remove those, then this board will come out. Like so. 
Here's our switch. Uh, on this model, line out and tape out are shared by the same plug, so that's changing the mode. You've got your line out or tape out or sync out sockets here, your power input and your power switch. And uh, this jack socket here is your effect send. The shielding is attached to the back of this mixer board by two screws here. This one and this one. At this point, I would suggest that it's useful to mark which of these holes are intended to have a screw coming through from the shielding, because otherwise what you can do on reconstruction is put screws in those holes, go, oh, and then have to take the screws out and put them in again. So it'll just save yourself a bit of a faff if you write on this with Sharpie. Then we've got another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine screws to remove. So I'll just go off screen and do that. If you haven't already removed the knobs from the front, and that's something you're going to need to do in order to get the mixer out from behind. For this model, the only knobs that I find that need a little bit of encouragement to come off are the fader caps. So I'm using some sort of plastic implement to get underneath here and make sure I don't scratch the case. And then the uh, pitch adjust knob, that's going to be pretty difficult to get off. Really, you just need to wait and until that lifts off and make sure that you don't lose it. Okay, so the only bit that we've still got attached is this daughter board that has the uh, shuttle controls on it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five screws here. I've only reattached one of them for the purposes of this video. Let's quickly take that out. If any of these buttons were unresponsive, we could blow some contact cleaner through them. If any of these plastic button caps were broken, we could um, spin weld or JB weld. That's two-part glue. Some cut-up cable ties as splints along here. I've demonstrated that on a Tascam 244. The shielding then comes off from the front there. Uh, we can get in here and clean it. If you want to see the cleaning process in detail, check out the cleaning section. I've got a playlist on my YouTube channel. You can see that there are various knob caps you would need to take off in order to effectively clean those switches. Um, notice as well that they're not all quite the same size. You can do yourself a mischief getting these thinner ones for the track arm mixed up with these thicker ones. If you put them in the wrong place then the plastic case won't go back on top and you'll be scratching your head a bit so just watch out for that and you've got this one um, push push knob cap extender thing here so that's where that goes don't think there's anything else to remark on there so I guess the only other thing you might want to do is um, replace the door say you want to spin weld or JB weld a broken hinge uh, you can actually see that I had to do that on this one. That's the subject of a separate video. It may even be this door. Check the spin welding and plastic repair playlist on my YouTube channel if you want to see how to do that. Um, but you can see that there are metal screws. Um, these recesses go through plastic mounting posts. Notice that there is the square end of the spring that's going around this um, door hinge. Can you see that there? It's, it's out of focus because I'm in manual focus, but you see that's that's where that end goes, it wraps around there and then the straighter end that's just got a little L shape it's hard up against this plastic surface with the pointy part pointing upwards so if I um, unscrew that those clips are identical this spring went on this side so that's how the door goes in then when you're replacing this side you would put the spring back on that way with the u-shape on that side and the tiny little l shape that side pointing upwards slot it into the door first with that u-shape dangling can you see it wiggling about in there so it's not on the door it's down in this space here screw that down then use tweezers or a screwdriver to grab the, that u-shaped end and you're going to sl slot it around this door hinge so that's going to work in a slightly wonky way until we get the other pin in once we screw that in 
I've got this little push-push mechanism built in that the spring's going to push it up like that. If this uh, plastic button array doesn't come away, I mean, it will with encouragement. I think there's a little bit of adhesive under there. Uh, you can get under there with a flathead screwdriver. Uh, be careful, you can break it as well. But if for some reason you needed to take the whole thing out, I guess you could do that. Though I would tend to try and glue that in situ if I needed to. I'm trying to think if there's anything I've missed. Right, calibration. Let's have a quick look at where the um, trim pots are for any calibration you might need to do. Now, I haven't actually done a speed calibration on one of these. Usually there's a trim pot beside the pitch adjust, but not on this one. This model is also unusual because it has three speeds. So I'm wondering if in fact these three trim pots are. The writing's tiny, but um, you can see for track one, track two, track three, track four, this area here is where the trim pots are. It's written on the PCB record level, playback level, and playback EQ. So then that's going to be record level, playback level EQ in this sort of L-shaped constellation for each track. Um, so you can set your record and playback amplifiers there. Digital meters, I've never really had to adjust them. They tend to stay okay, whereas analog VUs, you do need to calibrate them on older machines. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, if you feel there's anything I missed out, let me know in the comments. But otherwise, thank you for watching and I hope to see you again soon.